Today, I want to highlight how universal withdrawal can be when you are taking any drug that acts in the brain. We haven't spent time talking about dopamine agonists on this channel yet, which are more so prescribed by neurologists. Dopamine agonists like Ropinarol or Requip or Pamaprexol or Mirapex are medications that mimic the effect of dopamine at dopamine receptors. They are used to treat Parkinson's disease and restless leg syndrome. They can also be used off-label to treat depression and fibromyalgia. They have many serious adverse effects that necessitate discontinuation of the treatment, like impulse control disorders, also things like hallucinations or low blood pressure. However, when patients have attempted to stop their dopamine agonist, some of them have developed withdrawal syndromes that were noted to be highly stereotyped between patients. This means that they looked very similar between the different patients and they resembled other stimulant withdrawal syndromes. There's an excellent review article to reference during this video by Melissa Nuremberg about dopamine agonist withdrawal syndromes, or DAWS, D-A-W-S. Here is a table of the most common symptoms. As you can see, there are many of the same symptoms as with antidepressant and benzodiazepine withdrawal that we have discussed commonly on this channel. This table, table two, discusses the secondary consequences of DAWs. It is common that these patients can become over-medicated with levodopa, which is one of the primary medications for Parkinson's, or other neuro and psych meds when the treating provider misinterprets DAWs symptoms as under-medication of the original condition, whether it's Parkinson's or restless legs, or perhaps as symptoms of a new psychiatric disorder. This can result in dopamine dysregulation syndrome which can present with confusion, psychosis, and dyskinesias. These are abnormal movement disorders. A huge impact on functioning is noted here, affecting career, marriage, leisure, and even criminal activity for those with impulse control disorders as a side effect. The author makes a great point that some of these long-term consequences are not due to DAWs itself, but they're a side effect of the dopamine agonists that were reinstated because the patients could not complete a taper due to the severe withdrawal symptoms. DAWs has been mainly reported in Parkinson's disease, where it affects about 15 to 19 percent of the patients who taper or discontinue a dopamine agonist, and it occurs in an even higher percentage, about one out of three, of those patients who need to taper off their dopamine agonist because of impulse control disorders that occurred as a side effect. Just like what we see with other psychiatric medications, the timing of onset of DAWs is variable. Many patients develop symptoms immediately after the initial dose reduction. Some patients may not experience any symptoms until the tail end of their taper or even after they completed the taper. And DAWs can still occur in an extremely slow taper. A full recovery has been noted in about half of the Parkinson's disease patients with DAWs, which took place over days to weeks. The remaining patients experience protracted withdrawal syndrome that lasts for months to years. So what increases your risk of DAWs? First, there is a dose-response relationship, meaning that the higher your dose is and the longer you take a dopamine agonist, the higher your risk for DAWs upon stopping. Second, there is a close association between DAWs and patients who develop impulse control disorders when taking the dopamine agonist. There have been no specific treatments found effective for DAWs, including various psychiatric medications or therapies like CBT. The author stresses that dopamine agonist therapy should be used judiciously, avoiding prolonged and high-dose exposure. This approach can be applied to all medications that act on the brain and which carry the risk of withdrawal. The author also emphasizes close monitoring for the development of impulse control disorders, since these are so highly associated with DAWs, which raises the question if patients may actually fare better who taper their dopamine agonist upon the first sign of an impulse control disorder, which can present with compulsive eating, gambling, shopping, and hypersexuality. It is reassuring that the author talks about the importance of informed consent when starting a dopamine agonist and involving a loved one of the patient in the informed consent process. This is important because it'll allow them to observe the person for impulse control disorders right after they start taking the medication. Another important point made in this article includes reminding hospital staff that doors can emerge unpredictably for anyone hospitalized whose medications are decreased or temporarily held for a surgery. Lastly, 
They discuss the risk of doors occurring when a pharmacy may change between brand name and generic formulations of a medication without informing the patient. There have been many parallels when discussing doors to psychiatric medication withdrawal. Both affect a portion of the patients and there are likely specific vulnerabilities that can increase someone's risk. Both withdrawal syndromes can be self-limited or develop into a protracted form. Both may share many of the same symptoms and both are often misdiagnosed that can lead to over-medication and a prescribing cascade. Both can be the reason a patient remains on a medication despite disabling side effects. Both need more education disseminated to providers and patients along with increased dedicated research. Do you have any experience with dopamine agonists or DOORS? Please share in the comments below.